we are talking about revolution this evening, and uh, specifically the French Revolution, but perhaps it has some uh, parallels with, with some sort of inner revolution. But, but let, let's get go over to, to Professor Danton. Now, Bob, where are you this evening? Uh, hello, Bob. Bob, we should have told you to um, unmute. I'm so sorry. Yeah, can you hear me now? Not you. No, we Not can. You. Hi. Uh, welcome, Hi. Professor. Thanks yes. so much. Where, where, where are you right now? Well, I'm sitting in a beautiful 17th century townhouse, the Hotel de Lausanne. It's on the Ile Saint-Louis, just behind uh, Notre Dame Cathedral as it's being restored. Um, I'm at an Institute for Advanced Study. So I'm a, a fellow here for a month and I'm, I'm a happy person. It's a great place to be. It's <laughs> raining outside and the, uh, the farmers in France are unhappy and some of the garbage isn't being collected, but this is a beautiful city and it's just sparkling actually with activity and fun. Well, it was certainly sparkling in the 18th century. This book, uh, and there was lots of fun. There was also lots of violence, sex, lies, um, intrigues. And it's an incredible story that you put together in, in this, um, uh, in the revolutionary temper in this study, which uh, comes really from, from the original sources, primary sources. Uh, you haven't just read a few other books. Um, what was your research process, Bob? How long did it take you to put this together? I mean, it's, a, it's quite a feat of scholarship. I know that um, this has been a subject of interest for you for, for many decades. Yes. Well, I mean, in a sense, I've been working on this book for 60 years. Uh, my tutor at Oxford, where I did my DPhil, suggested the title, Revolutionary Temper. And his name was Harry Pitt. He became a dear friend. He's died since. But uh, in a way, the book is a tribute to him. and. Uh, it summarizes research I've done ever since. Research in a special field now called the history of books, which flourishes in England as well as in France. Um, I've done a lot of study of what books actually circulated, how did they reach readers, um, how did ideas penetrate into French society. Some of that has involved uh, a good deal of old fashioned scholarship going through mountains of manuscript. I found the, uh, or rediscovered the papers of an 18th century publisher, the only one whose archives had survived, the Société Typographique de Neuchâtel. And there, there were 50,000 letters by everyone who had anything to do with books authors, publishers, booksellers, but also book smugglers, the people who made the ink, the, the, the workers who pulled the bar of the press. So I spent, a, I spent a lot of time trying to get a very precise grip on this problem of what did the French read? How did they react to books? What actually were the bestsellers uh, during 18th century France? And meanwhile, I got interested in other forms of communication, such as songs uh, or rumors or underground newspapers, even forms of communication that were parades. Uh, I, have, I begin the book actually with a discussion of war and peace and how did ordinary people know anything about war and peace in a city where there were no newspapers. Uh, how did you find out what was happening? Well, there was something called the publication of the peace after the war of the Austrian succession in 1748. Publication. But the publication was a parade. It wasn't uh, something printed, a gigantic parade of 800 people that stopped at 13 different sites in Paris. The drums rolled, the trumpets blared, and then the Royal Herald said, we've stopped fighting. That's about all people knew. Tell us about the 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 tree of uh, Krakow, if I pronounced that correctly. I mean, that was an amazing institution uh, and a sort of you know lo location for swapping news. 
um, yes. which involved men with long canes doing sort of sketches in, in the dust. Right, well, there was actually a very large chestnut tree in the northern section of the garden of the Palais Royal. Now, the Palais Royal belonged to the Orléans house. Uh, so it was what was known actually as a public space, a lieu public, where anyone could go, but not the police. The police could not raid the um, brothels, the gambling dens, and especially the book shops that were crammed into this beautiful, enormous garden uh, because it belonged to the Duc d'Orléans. Uh, and so uh, it was his turf, so to speak. Mm. Uh, and therefore, that's where people gathered. I mean, how did you find out what had happened in a city without newspapers, without, of course, internet, TV, and the rest of it? You went to this tree. This was, it was a famous place where nouvellistes or newsmongers gathered. Uh, they would get together and in an oral way, exchange information that they had found out. And it was such an important institution that in fact, uh, foreign ambassadors would send servants to pick up the news or to plant news. Uh, because this, is, this, this was the key nerve center among many there. And it was called the tree of Krakow for various reasons, but one was that the word krak in French meant a lie or what today we would call disinformation. Mm -hmm. And so presumably when people were telling uh, stories and inaccurate rumors, the tree was supposed to go krak. Uh, <laughs> Well, things, of course, things spread from there. I mean, I'm simplifying, but it's an example of how a, uh, a communication system had a nerve center and how information circulated by word of mouth. Now, these, there were also nouvelles, nouvelles de main because people would take notes at the tree of Krakow and then you'd go to a cafe and you would pull a note out of your sleeve or your waistcoat pocket and read it to others or trade it from other notes. And then later, people would put the notes together in little manuscript journals called Nouvelle à la Main, which circulated underground and gave a more systematic view of things. So I could go on and on, but the point is you get a shift from oral communication to handwritten communication. And then later, these manuscript news sheets were printed, not in France, it was too dangerous, but uh, one is called the Mémoire Secret sur l'Histoire de la République des Lettres en France, 36 volumes, wonderful volumes, full of gossip, um, information about what the beautiful people are doing, and a good deal of political intrigue. And it was a little bit similar in, uh, in, in the London of the 18th century, wasn't it? Because over there, we were seeing the rise of Grub Street, the pamphleteers, the, the coffee shops, um, the sort of bewigged gentleman talking about uh, the news from Tripoli. Yes, well, here we are on the Idler. And of course, uh, Samuel Johnson was very well informed. What's amazing is that France is more than twice the population of England but it did not have a daily newspaper until uh, 1777, the Journal de Paris, and that was heavily censored. So it didn't carry really news about public affairs, whereas Amsterdam, where daily newspapers began, and then London, they'd had newspapers for a century already. So the English are far in advance when it comes to a more developed journalism, but even there, the, you know, the unit in the newspapers in London in the 18th century is the paragraph. It's nothing more than that. And if you look at an English newspaper, it's just a sea of type, no headlines, usually no advertisements. Um, you just have one paragraph after another. There's no connection between them, no kind of general narrative. The French also, communicated uh, chunks of news, which I, th I would call paragraphs. 
The word for them, curiously, was anecdote. Anecdotes. Mm. And, and an anecdote, if you look it up in 18th century dictionaries, means something quite different from what it means today. It meant secret news, but news that really happened, uh, not just uh, anything, uh, misinformation. And so this kind of secret news was, was standard. And I've uh, looked in some of the forbidden books and found that paragraphs or anecdotes um, are lifted from one book to another book and that the unit of communication is often not so much the book as this chunk of information called the anecdote or the paragraph in that respect, not so different from, from London, that we, where you had paragraph men. And, and I mean, not so uh, the obvious point to make, isn't it? But I mean, not so different from tweets today when you just have this little sort of chunk of information, not so different from fake news, disinformation, uh, the rival information pumpers from the different groups are all sort of fighting. But Bob, let me ask you about the police. Uh, you mentioned the police a lot in the book. There was yes. a police force. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think we had a police force in, in London until the sort of 1850s or something like that. Um, yeah. when, when you call them the police, how did the police work? And, 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 and more than that, you know, what was the sort of political setup? It was a, it was a monarchy. Um, the, the, the Louis were, it was mainly Louis XV during this period. Um, and, you know, he seemed to have the, this police force uh, at, at his disposal with it with its spies and um, I mean the, the police seem to be absolutely everywhere and that seems to be uh, you know I was quite surprised by the sort of sophistication of the state machinery if you sure. like in the middle yeah. 18th century. Well you know it's a, it's an important point so while the French were a century behind the English in newspapering they were a century ahead in policing yeah. uh, and the Real, the real serious organization of the police of Paris in 1667 created what was seen as a modern phenomenon in the rest of Europe. But the word police in 18th century French has a very different meaning. I mean, we tend to think of crime. Actually, it meant municipal administration. Okay. And the lieutenant general of police was really the most powerful figure in Paris. He really ran Paris insofar as anyone did. He had an elaborate uh, bureaucracy working under him. Uh, he reported to the minister for the department of Paris, who was part of the king's household. So we're talking about an archaic structure. But the actual functioning of the police was simply remarkable. Uh, I've spent weeks and weeks reading the archives unpublished of the Lieutenant General of Police of uh, Le Noir, and he talks about uh, lighting for the city, hygiene, uh, health of all kinds, markets, the price of bread, and especially literature, because there was an inspector of literature. <laughs> uh, and this inspector, the one I know best, is a man called Joseph Demery. He uh, in between 1748 and 52, accumulated uh, 501 reports on writers in Paris. He did a systematic study of the literary population. Mm -hmm. He had printed forms and he filled them out in, in hand, long hand. And you can find all the famous philosophers, Diderot, Rousseau, Montesquieu. Uh, but uh, along with them, you find a lot of Grub Street hacks. And I've developed a special interest for Grub Street characters, borrowing the term from London, but I, Paris did not have a single street where the hacks congregated, but it had Mansard or Garrets everywhere, and they were filled with writers. Um, so I've, this is a separate uh, book that I've just finished. It's, uh, uh, I've estimate the actual number of writers and how many of them uh, were Grub Street types and how many of them were more or less integrated into society. All of this is part of the world overseen by the police. And as I said, uh, or you mentioned, I think, Mark, they, there were 
spies everywhere. We estimate 3,000 police spies, and they were in all the cafes, and their reports, I've read hundreds of their reports in the archives in, of the Bastille, they're often written in dialogue. So you have the illusion, it's not perfect, but the illusion of listening in to cafe conversations. Wow. It's, it's wonderful. So this whole world, thanks in large part to the police, is a world that we can reconstruct in order to find out how information actually flowed. And you can reconstruct fa fairly accurately. I mean, the, the, the detail, the life in the book is incredible. Now, let's talk about money, because this is a big issue all the way through taxes. And you just mentioned the price of bread. Yes. I mean, this is such a common, this is such a kind of recurrent uh, theme, the price of bread. I mean, it's almost like it's a kind of a symbol for other things. But sometimes the price, the price of bread did, did sort of rock it away, whether that was due to kind of, you know, speculation by financiers. People complained about these massive taxes they were having to put up with, which they didn't get taken away uh, when the war ended. They also were complaining about the uh, luxurious spending at court. So money um, seems to be a very key factor uh, in this sort of four decade build up to the revolution. It was terribly important. And of course it's linked with bread. Now we know a lot about uh, what people ate. Uh, the main, the main central ingredient in their diet was bread. Um, the four pound loaf was supposed to cost eight sous, um, but in bad times it could nearly double. So if your diet depends on bread, you could prepare food in different ways. Often you break the bread up and to make a kind of mash. Uh, but if you depend on it and the price goes up that much, you are desperate. Yeah. So there were bread riots. They've been much studied by historians, including some uh, well famous uh, English historians like George Houdet. Uh, these bread riots were endemic. The most famous of them took place in 1775 when the price of bread shot up. And uh, there were 1,000 bakeries that were sacked uh, dur during a, a, a three day period in uh, 1775. It was extraordinary. I mean, the crowd really took Paris, controlled Paris for a certain amount of time. The police force was not adequate to put it down. They just let it burn out. And it was accompanied by something known at the time as the famine plot. So you got not, not just violence, but you got rumor accompanying violence. And according to this rumor, speculators were withholding grain from the market so that the prices would rise and then they could dump their grain at a very high price. Uh, it was a conspiracy and who were the leading conspirators? Well, there were lots of people mentioned, but one was the king. Mm. So uh, the point is that uh, the violence is accompanied by rumor, by talk, um, and even violence itself uh, is interesting. I think that Mark uh, mentioned emotion as part of our general makeup as we interact with other people, the word for riot was often a popular emotion, une émotion populaire. Oh. So people explode in emotion, often anger. Uh, that's what they did during the, uh, the, the, the bread riots of 1775. Uh, and they also acted things out. So they didn't just smash everything. They would break into a bakery take the bread, and then sometimes even pay for it at what they, es they esteem to be the just price. Mm. So eight sous instead of 14 or 15 sous. Um, and then, of course, the word spread about this uh, famine plot. So all of this is part of uh, a, an entire information system, which is working in many media all the time, that's how people made sense of events. One of the rumors was of disappearing children. And that, that really yeah. got people going, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, that was uh, extraordinary, an extraordinary thing. 
In 1749, uh, the police were directed from Versailles, actually, uh, to uh, arrest street urchins who were bothering pedestrians. Well, they arrested them, uh, took them to a prison outside of France, and then they meant to send them off back into the countryside. But uh, along the way, they arrested a lot of children of artisans and bourgeois who used the street as a playground. And sometimes these children would scream from the wagons where they were put by the police agents. People would hear the screams, they'd come running out. There would be another popular emotion, a riot. Uh, at one point in uh, 1749, the rioters captured a police agent. They beat him to death. They dragged him through the streets, deposited the body in front of the residence of the Lieutenant General of Police who ran out the back door. Um, and they actually controlled Paris for a night. Uh, it was very violent. And uh, actually, it was accompanied by an even more interesting rumor because word spread that the children were actually being kept in order to be bled so that their blood could make a blood bath that could would cure a prince of the blood from some exotic disease like leprosy. Um, people believe this. And, uh, you know, it, it summoned up very ancient myths, a myths of, um, uh, well, especially the massacre of the innocents by Herod. The police spies are taking all this in. They write reports. The reports reach Louis XV, and he says, I'm going to avoid Paris as much as I can because they have called me a Herod. And sure enough, he built a, a, a road around Paris mm. so that when he went from Versailles to Compiègne, for his hunting, one of his favorite hunting places, he wouldn't have to set foot in Versailles. He had it paved and it was known as Le Chemin de la Révolte, the road of revolt. Oh, so he didn't and have to you see what I mean? I'm talking about misinformation, the notion of a famine pack, the notion of a bloodbath, uh, these wild uh, quasi mythological uh, tales are passed from mouth to mouth. People believe them. And some of the extraordinary bits of misinformation that we have today are, I think, rather similar. 